Hey guys, so in this video I'm going to share how I go about basing my salamanders desert skiing bases. It's a pretty simple process and I think it's really effective and visually interesting. And so the recipe is you start with some texture paint from Citadel, which is a Ghrelin Badland. Then we follow that up with a wash of Cassandora Yellow, Skeleton Bone, and then a weathering powder of your choice that's yellow. I'm using Cromlech Dark Sand weathering powder, and the bases are rimmed with Steel Legion Drab as the final process. Two uh, important points though, with these three steps, um, it's important not to do them uniformly. You want to add variation in different areas to draw your eye around and create contrast over the course of the base. We don't want the same consistency of wash across the entire surface or else, uh, well, we're going to get less contrast and it'll be less interesting all, and it'll be ultimately less interesting. So watch along and I'll show how these three processes are handled. Uh, in a way that I think yields maximum interest for any basing scheme you, do, you end up doing, not just this desert one. And also for the texture paint, um, I'm using Agrelin Badland, um, and it's important not to use Agrelin Earth because it gives a completely different effect. That's the crackle variety of this uh, texture paint. And I want more of that arid kind of desert soil type of look. Uh, lastly, sometimes on my bases I add some stone details, but as you can see with this classic Dreadnought base, there are large portions of stone, and we're going to cover up uh, maybe the better half of it with texture paint, uh, but for the areas that are stone, we're going to use a very simple, you know, uh, basing process, Mechanicus Standard Gray, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Mechanicus Standard Gray, washed with Agrax Earthshade, and then dry brushed with Dawnstone. Super simple. Um, and those areas are probably going to get dry brushed and hit by these processes as well. So it'll kind of blend together and it should give a nice cohesive look. Um, something akin to this Dreadnought, but we're probably going to... I want to increase the amount of uh, desert texture. Alright, so our first step will be to get some of these stone areas done in Mechanica Standard Gray. All right, so we're just gonna let that first coat dry and then um, if we need to, we can hit it with another coat because that was pr a pretty thin application. You can go pretty thick with your basing, uh, you're doing basing work, but it doesn't hurt to be too thin. All right, so with this guy now dry, I'm gonna do one more thin coat and then we're gonna go straight to uh, the texture paint. All right, so with the base, uh, the stone work done on the base, we are ready to begin applying this texture paint. I'm using the Citadel uh, texture spreading tool, um, but you can use any like low profile palette knife is just as suitable. Let's pop this open and we're gonna begin spreading it on. I'm gonna put a whole bunch on the base to start. And oh, this couldn't be more inconvenient. Okay, that was like a nice, a nice size here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is put a whole bunch here. Um, I have a vague idea of how I want this positioned. Um, and I actually put a clump of green stuff on the back of the base because I always I was working on a different conversion project and I always take way too much green stuff. So I had some excess and I just built up the the base of the, uh, well, I just put it on the base uh, just to create a little bit of variation. And that's kind of going to be where the bulk of the um, texture paint will sit. But... We're gonna have it wrap around and kind of encroach onto um, about a good half, maybe 66% um, of the base will be hit with the texture paint. Yeah, so I guess the goal is to 
just like with the remaining three phases, which is a wash, dry brush, and um, weathering powder, we want to create some variation in density and, I guess, texture. So it's not uniform because things in nature are a little random. I guess that's, well, that's the idea. Maybe that's not a rule, maybe. But for the aesthetic, I'm going for anyways. I'm not an expert um, by the laws of nature. Um, when you're doing this kind of work, you're gonna ruin your paint job a little bit. I mean, you know, you want to, um, you know, messy up your paint job to the degree that you want it to be, right? And what I mean to say is, sorry, it's difficult to narrate and try and work. Um, the idea is to hit your model in such a way where, yeah, it makes sense that it would be dirty because it's walking through this environment uh, without, you know, pulling uh, dirt all over it. But I mean, then again, you know, who knows how heavy the winds are and what kind of aesthetic you're going for with your own weathering. So you can kind of justify anything because it is kind of like an art, right? Like, like in, in the sense that it's an expression of what you're trying to do and represent with the characters and units and all that stuff. Yeah, this stuff takes forever to dry, so I'm actually going to leave this overnight. Actually, I got a fair bit more on my knife still, so I have to like pull this off somewhere. Okay, I'll scoop it. So, yeah, I'll probably put it like in this area. Just kind of bring it through. Bring it through here. And yeah, we're just... So this is some pretty interesting variation. We got a low area, like none, none, a low area and a very thick area. So that should, um, when, you know, the texture paint dries, it should yield a pretty interesting effect, I hope. Um, and as long as you maintain that kind of intent with the remaining three steps of the of the process, it's actually, um, that's kind of the recipe I use, really. Yeah, it's actually, these pots aren't the best um, for using texture paint. You want something with a wider opening. But this is what I have currently to use, so. Actually, if any viewers out there know any replacements or, or alternate products to the Agrelin Badland, um, both in texture, I mean, textures, uh, sorry, color's a bonus, but texture is really what I'm looking for, because you can always paint your, your texture paint before you wash it to kind of get the, the matching aesthetic if you switch products. Okay, so... Where are we here? Maybe we can apply some, um, almost like it's paint, right? Almost like it's paint. Come on, get in there. Okay, and let's try and People often ask me why I didn't do lava bases, um, and well, it's really because lava day bases are more work, and when you're painting a whole army, I find it to be very painstaking to do something as um, labor intensive from an artistic perspective as lava bases across a whole army it can get a little I don't know, soul crushing in a way. And I find it to be that way. So I prefer bases that are a bit more abstract and random, and you can kind of, I guess, simply 
I think for painting an army, you want a basing scheme that you can do quick and dirty and achieve a very nice result with. Whereas lava bases, like you almost have to put the same amount of effort as you would be painting a model to get the gradients between the reds, yellows, and sometimes whites um, to go together. Uh, okay, so I don't like how clean this area is, so I'm going to messy up this a bit and bring some of that down. Bring that up. Let me put some in that groove there. I just realized I was incredibly off center. Okay, so I think this might be a pretty cool result. Um, all right, so once this dries, oh yeah, um, one one tip you want to do um, is. You want to preserve the rim of your bases so that they're kind of clean and not textured up. Um, so I just wet my fingers and, you know, this stuff takes a while to dry, so we got time to work. And I just kind of, you know, you firmly um, press and drag your wet finger across and then that way we kind of make sure we have that smooth edge. So that should be more than adequate. You can do this after it dries too, but I find it easier to just do it now at this stage. Okay, so we'll let this dry. Make sure you close the lid of your texture paint and give it some time to dry and then we'll come back and continue. All right, so the texture paint has had some time to dry and it's fully hardened and has begun to look like a arid kind of desert earth, which is the exact effect I was desiring for this desert base. The next step is going to be um, washing the, the desert surface with Cassandora yellow. And we are going to apply it all over, but in select areas we're going to apply it heavier to create a bit of variation throughout the texture, so it's not all one even shade. Um, and during this step, we're going to also wash the Agrax Earthshade over the stone areas that are still remaining, just to give it a more weathered and... Uh, yeah, just to make it weathered and add some tonal variety. Actually, for this process, we're going to need a much bigger brush. So we're going to begin with just putting it all over in a kind of even layer, and then we'll add some heavier areas. That that would the heavier areas are gonna read in this kind of tone. They're gonna look really orange because of the the density of the wash. Yeah. Um, it's important for the scheme not to leave very obvious patches of unwashed texture paint because it, 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 it's fairly stark, the comparison between the, the yellowed earth and just kind of like the beige, unwashed texture paint. Um, and I quite like the result. It reminds me of kind of like an Age of Empires 2, like desert map. Like a fairly, not totally realistic, because it's like extremely yellow, but I think it makes for a nice contrasting base, and who knows? These are sci-fi worlds these guys could be on, so I think it gives us some creative freedom. We don't have to make things 100% realistic. All right, so this is what I would call now a fairly even distribution of the wash. So what we're gonna do, fairly simply, is we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna load up our brush quite a bit, and then we're gonna add some heavier areas to um, the surface that um, kind of just peppering it around to create some variation in the earth and the effect when you're doing this technique across the this step the dry brush step and the uh, weathering powder uh, it creates a very interesting uh, effect, uh, result that I think is 
but well it's 100 percent the way i'm going to do all my bases going forward i think it's far more interesting than just a static um you know consistent uh, level of tone on your basic okay so those areas are done for the agrax earthshade um and because I actually want the desert texture to be the draw of the space, the interesting component, I'm not going to do this technique where we're putting emphasis on certain areas throughout. For the purpose of the stone, you just kind of want to accent it and let it blend. But not, not draw too much attention away from... Excuse me. Not draw too much attention away from the desert texture. So you can see, you know, I'm using the small brush again, and we're just I'm applying applying the wash on the areas that are exposed stone. And because, you know, these are both washes, they will blend visually to um, the degree the degree at which they can, I guess, you know, um, better than base coats would blend just by being on top of each other. I guess that's the translucent nature of the washes. That should look pretty good. You know, you don't have to be perfect. If you get some Agrax Earthshade on the desert sand, it's not going to be the end of the world. We just want those nice details of the stones, those crags and cracks, to um, have some definition from this dirty wash. All right, and while your wash dries, maybe um, watch a, consider watching a battle report. I think I I recommend Tabletop Tactics. They're pretty popular. You probably already heard of them, but very entertaining uh, content as far as battle reports go. Okay, so we've given our washes time to dry. I've also hit some of these bullets on the base with some Balthazar gold and that's about all they'll need because they're very small uh, accessories and, they, and they're going to be covered with dry brush and um, obscured for the most part so you don't have to spend a ton of time on those super small details. So for the dry brushing stage we're going to do a somewhat precise like controlled dry brush on, of Dawnstone on the stone areas and then we're going to do a much messier um, dry brush on the desert areas and this is gonna hit some of the stone areas as well just to represent some of the, the desert sands and the weathering drifting across this you know once paved and clean area and with skeleton bone we're gonna do this little skull on the base as well but first we'll start with Dawnstone so you get your paper and Work the, work the paint into your brush. It's pretty standard stuff. Um, and from here, we can just do some very controlled uh, sweeps on the stonework areas, trying as best as possible not to, uh, not to hit the, the desert surfaces that we have. put so much work into thus far. Yeah, this is my all-purpose old beat-up brush. I suggest you always use these kinds of brushes for your dry brushing. So we can build that up a bit more, get some nice tonal contrast being built up, looking good. And carry that along these ridges here, hit that area. And get these stones over here. And that's nearly done. Uh, get underneath, sure, sure, get all those spots. Okay, so I'll give that brush a proper clean later. Um, and now we can get some skeleton bone. Um, or you could use bleached bone, any generic bone. Beige color will work 
for this purpose. It doesn't have to be, you know, a one-to-one -one exact match of this recipe. Um, so I'm just going to grab my basic brush here. And with skeleton bone, I'm just going to, um, you know, with some care, um, hit this area. But you don't want to be too delicate because you're going to dry brush this bone color um, across a large portion of the base. So if it hits anywhere, don't don't worry too much. You can clean it up if you want to, but it will probably look just fine. Um, once you do some dry brushing of this color around and it, then you just build it up heavier in that area and it looks fairly natural okay so this guy is uh, as, a, as far as skulls go he's pretty adequate I think at this point um, I should wait to let that dry quickly to give it a, a quick wash of Seraphim Sepia or Agrax Earthshade, some brown wash to weather the bone because um, this is a this is looking very clean and fresh at the moment, so you want it to be worn down before you dry brush it. So I'm gonna do that real quick and we'll come back for the final dry brushing of skeleton bone. Now with the skull here all ready to go. Um, we can begin the final step, which will be dry brushing some skeleton bone or, you know, your own bone color. Uh, any sort of beige will do, um, just to add a little bit of bright variation as well. So you just want to work the paint into your brush and then in a very, in a way that appears and feels counterintuitive, you want to get it all off. Because you just want to be able to gradually build up because it's very painful to have too uh, too much and difficult to remove and then we're going to just kind of use circular motions to provide some you know even coverage to the um, all over really because you know the even the stone areas will be weathered by the Uh, the dust and debris, sand and all that stuff. And during this process, you will probably hit the feet a little bit, but that's okay because if you're walking through an environment, your, your feet are gonna get dirty if the environment's dirty, right? So it should add a nice, um, it should create a link, like a bridge between the model and the base to, so it looks like your model's there. I think that's the goal with with many basing schemes. So now that we got the all over highlights done to the base, um, I like to repeat what we did with the wash and add a few areas of greater intensity. Um, and we can use this to kind of break up areas that are too, um, too strong or too dark to add some, some variety, um, add some visual interest, like if you see the large area here, that's for the most part all one tone, There's a little bit of dark area here from the wash, so maybe over here we can add a little bit of, uh, you know, brightness, increase the value in this area to um, create a little bit of visual interest. It's subtle, but I think it goes a long way towards keeping your bases as you know, dynamic as possible without taking away from the, the model itself. So it's interesting and complementary. And then we're ready for the weathering powder, which is essentially going to be done the same way. I'm just going to clean off my brush and be right back. So the thing with weathering powders is they can be used either wet or dry. And the clue to, or the guide that I like to use is, is the environment I'm making wet or dry? And in this case, obviously the desert is dry, so we're not going to be um, mixing any water with this at all. So we're just going to open up our weathering powder and, you know, you can, you can grab it from the pot and, you know, put it on the lid, which is usually what I like to do. Um, and again, you want to build up gradually. Um, 
But the thing about weathering powders is how, at least how I find them to be, is that you can kind of really work with it quite a bit. So for instance, um, I'm gonna add a little bit of weathering powder here. And now as we work it through, um, it's beginning to hue and add, get a bit more, um, a little bit of, you know, dust and, uh, you know, desert grit that'll help make this guy feel as if he's, you know, been waging war through this world. Okay, we'll go over this way. And I really like to work the weathering powder into the um, the recesses and, you know, crags and the low points of the bases because that's where, you know, you would have buildup of, of sand and, um, you know, with the way the wind's blowing, things like that. And also, doing it this way, we get that, that effect where we can pepper in higher intensity and higher value um, tones into our basing scheme. And you can see by adding the weathering powder in this way, we're really, uh, it does a good, it goes a long way towards selling the, the feel that this is a, you know, a desert wasteland or a, a desert world, however you like to you know, imagine the, or however you like to term your, your narratives. And I think this will be the last bit of, you know, weathering powder we add. It's added quite a bit there. But it's still, you know, within a, my control to place and build up how we want it to be. Yeah, so I think that's enough for the base. What I do want to do is add a bit more to his feet. I'm just gonna grab, uh, uh, put some there, and put up another blotch here, and just kind of, you know, build it up, and it's going to. Just add that little extra, um, that extra little bit of, I guess, detail and care that makes your models feel as if they are really in their base, like they're in the world, rather than being placed on a, on a terrain. Alrighty. So weathering powder can get a bit messy in your workspace, and you definitely don't want to get it where you don't want it, because it is a little painful to remove once it kind of adheres. Uh, but it's pretty easy to clean up. You just get your, just dip your, you know, some paper towel into your water. All right, and with the base now done, this desert base is complete. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at how I go about doing my desert bases and my base methodology in general. Um, if you want to help this channel grow, please subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you guys in the next one.